Okay. Well, let's just dive right in. I'm so excited about today's topic of using nature to cultivate hope. And before we jump too far in, I want you to check out the chat box and in the chat box, you will see a sign in link for your 10 healthy lifestyles points for being here today. Um, this month has been dedicated to mental health and the nature of hope. The goal is to reconnect our healthy lifestyles participants with the outdoors as a way to boost your happiness, as a way to boost your overall mental health. Albert Einstein once said, if you look deep into nature, then you will understand everything a little bit better. This concept of nature being a healing factor for us has not, it's not new, but it has been forgotten as most of us are spending nearly 95% of our day inside, if you can believe it or not. So today I want to remind you that there are symbols of hope all around us. We just need to get outside and open up our eyes and our minds and learn from nature. And learning from nature is not necessarily about understanding things on an intellectual level, but having a direct experience of being in nature can have lessons drop into your mind, into your body, or even into your souls. So we encourage you to spend time each day outside soaking up all the benefits that nature has on our physical and mental health. And we're gonna go over each of those today and all the lessons that nature has if we just open up our minds. And I believe it's important that we define what hope is before we jump into symbolism about hope. But I want to hear from you. You can put it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself if that's easier. What is your definition of hope? We have not giving up. feeling like things will get better, happiness, focus on the future, expecting something positive, expectation of good things to come, something to look forward to, any other answers, something somebody hasn't said yet? We have optimism regarding a positive outcome or situation. Exactly. These answers are all wonderful and they're all correct. Um, my favorite definition is from environmentalist Jane Goodall. So she describes hope as going beyond that wishful thinking, going beyond faith or optimism. She sees real hope requiring some sort of action or engagement. I think it was Angie who put in the chat box, not giving up. So hope is just beyond that inner feeling or inner thoughts for something good to happen, but actually putting that thought or feeling into action. So it's putting your belief into hard work and then trusting that your hard work will pay off. So whether you are going through change or some sort of hardship or just the daily struggles through life, I want to spend today reminding you to find hope in the world around you because there are many examples and true hope that enlightens us and motivates us to fill up our own cup. We have that concept, right, that um, having a cup half full or half empty or overflowing cup or having a hole in your cup, whatever that may be to you, finding hope um, that can motivate us to actually fill up our own cup. So whether that's seeing a bird using broken branches to create a home or a colony of ants lifting objects three times their size, there are powerful lessons of nature all around us. And I'm gonna go through a couple of them today and I want you to share some examples that pop into your mind as we go through too. 
So one of the first things that nature teaches us is how to be adaptable. And that is actually the most important process in nature or living in this complex world is the ability to be adaptable. And adaptability is what has allowed all organisms from the beginning of biological time since 3.5 billion years ago that you, in order to survive and thrive, you must be adaptable. And so I have this example of this picture right here of some water lilies. So water lilies, they have a number of adaptions that help them survive in the water, including their really big leaves, as you can see right here. So the big leaves that flow on the water surface, um, they attract sunlight for photosynthesis, right? The top side of the leaf is covered with a cuticle to keep it as dry as possible, and on the underside has thorns to protect against predators. And so some other examples of adaptability that we can see in nature are bend in branches. So this branch right here on the left is actually from the old limber pine trail in Logan Canyon. So just two hours north of Salt Lake, you can find there are many trees. You can see some in the background that have that bend. And this is evidence of adaptability. These trees have been bent from heavy winter storms, but still found their path back up to the sun. I don't know if anyone has seen this. I would love to hear in the chat if you've seen these ones. And Logan Cannon is pretty remarkable, the evidence of the heavy winter storms on those trees. Lots of different bends. And of course, you may have felt it this morning with a little bit of breeze and wind and the leaves flying everywhere, but autumn is a perfect example of adaptability. So nature shows us the ability to endure change. And as autumn begins, we are guided to learn acceptance and non-resistance. A green leaf doesn't resist turning red when autumn approaches. Trees don't resist leaves falling when winter arrives. They stand deeply rooted into the ground with their vulnerability out in the open and branches spread wide, surrendering to the universe going to winter. Some of us may do that, or some of us may run to our local coals and start getting all of our winter coats ready. I know I do that. But this is a perfect example of how nature just rolls with the punches, is completely adaptable, and it prepares, but it does not resist. And then if you can see in this photo on the right, we have an example of a chameleon. So of course, this is a very on the nose example of adaptability as chameleons change their color to actually reflect their mood and to camouflage themselves. So it is both a communication tool and a defense mechanism that allows them to survive. So when our communities, our organizations, and the world undergo some sort of change, it is those who choose to adapt to change that will thrive in it. So ultimately, a chameleon knows why he must adapt and that understanding keeps him from making or keeps him from making the arbitrary change. So what are some things that are popping into your mind as you're looking at these different examples of adaptability? Something that pops into my mind is we need to be adaptable, but we can also be authentic to ourselves. So like chameleons, we know who we are. We know our values. We know our true colors per se, but we also recognize the value of adapting to changes in our environment. We have some comments in the chat box. We have change as a constant, so we need to be able to adapt, roll with the punches. It is natural to adapt to the environment. Absolutely. Why do you think we resist so much to change?
change is hard. It's unknown. Sometimes it can be frightening if it's something that we've obviously never done before. Yeah, it can be frightening. It's almost like our survival mechanism, right? If it's something we feel unknown about, we resist because we don't necessarily know how we're going to react or if we're able to do it. Um, we have, I think we are hardwired to want to maintain a status quo. It can be uncomfortable. Yes, I definitely think that that's exactly where that resistance comes from. And so I have a couple of um, lessons or tips that you can take with you that nature shows us how to be adaptable, but how can we incorporate that into our lives, right? We're not necessarily a legitimate chameleon or um, autumn tree. So how does a human make it easier to adapt? And one of those things is focusing on what we can control. We talk about this all the time and it can be way easier said than done. But recognizing that sometimes all you can control is your effort and your attitude or your reaction. So when you put energy into the things you can control, you're going to be much more effective. And these things take practice and over time they become part of our thoughts and attitudes. So if you are somebody who is reluctant to change or if somebody who kind of pushes back on change, it's going to take some time to overcome that, but knowing that it does get easier as you practice. And another great lesson for adaptability is finding the will to keep going. So in the book, The Third Door by Alex Banyan, it's the story of determination and adapting to obstacles by finding the third door. So he compares our life to a nightclub and he says that there's always three ways into a nightclub. There's the first door, so that's the main entrance where most people who are waiting in line get through once they get past um, security. The second door is the VIP entrance where we see celebrities or billionaires being able to slip right through with no care in the world. But no one tells you that there's always, always a third door. It's the entrance where you have to jump out of line. You have to run down the alley, bang on the door, couple hundred times or maybe crack it open a window or sneak through the kitchen but there's always a way so if you are interested in finding um, more mechanisms for being adaptable i highly recommend this book called the third door um, he goes through a bunch of um, different celebrities or public figures that um, have made it in life and how they've had to use the third door in order to get there All right, we're going to move on from adaptability and move on to resistance. They kind of go in hand in hand, right? If you become adaptable, then you are going to become more resilient. And as Charles Darwin always said, it's not the, um, the strongest of the fit or the fittest, nor the most intelligent. It is the most adaptable to change. And then Brittany put in the chat box, I feel like this is the ability to see the bigger picture and our perspective opens. And that's another thing that nature can show us, especially if you go out on a hike or if you go to a scenic outlook, if you can see the full picture of what you're looking at, then you're probably more willing to put up with roadblocks or a heavy winter or things like that. I'm using, I'm talking in metaphors today, if you're following along. Um, but seeing that full picture or seeing that view from the top can give you, um, you know, it's you're more willing to let go of the things that you can't control because you have that bigger picture in mind. Thank you for sharing that. Another lesson from nature is resilience. And this is actually one of my favorite stories when it comes to resilience in nature, and it is the 9-11 tree. So in October of 2001, a severely damaged pear tree was discovered at Ground Zero, where the World Trade Center used to stand. The tree had snapped its roots and um, branches were burned and broken, but its trunk was still intact. So the tree was removed from all of that rubble and placed in the care of the New York City Department of Parks and Recreation. 
And after nine years of recovery and rehabilitation, the tree has returned to the memorial in 2010. So I have that picture here. This is the tree in the springtime with the white blossoms. And then this green in the fall right over here is that tree. So now it stands at the World Trade Center Memorial. So they have smoothed the limbs and um, they actually have a program for the survivor tree where they take the seedlings from the survivor tree to communities that have endured tragedy. So after the Las Vegas shooting, um, the bombings in Paris and the terror attacks in Orlando, um, the seedlings from this 9-11 survivor tree was taken to these cities and they now have survivor trees in those areas too. Has anyone seen this in person? I went to New York City last year and I actually, I didn't know that this was here. So it kind of, it kind of shows you the resilience because there were so many trees. I, I kind of walked right past it. I learned about the 9-11 survivor tree after I had visited and which is kind of a bummer. I would have loved to have seen it, but it kind of shows you that it's an example of how life goes on. Patty says, this makes me cry so powerful. That's cool. I didn't know that. Yeah, I just recently learned about this as well. Very cool. And I still have this quote here. We persevere. We are resilient. Our limbs may break, but our foundation stays strong. Another example of resilience is through emperor penguins. So in our world, emperor penguins, they endure a lot. They um, actually live in some of the harshest conditions in the world. They live in sub-zero temperatures. They live with fierce winds of Antarctica. And they travel 50 miles for two to three months to gather food regardless of what happens. So these loyal penguins, they will always come back to their breeding colonies to share what they have found and feed the young. And the thing that is interesting about emperor penguins too is they are actually one of the only um, species of penguins that stay in the harshest conditions. The other species migrate to warmer temperatures as the winter arrives but the emperor penguins stay strong and they stay where they're at um, and they just endure these harsh, these harsh conditions. And so specifically to emperor penguins, I think they show us some great perseverance. So whether they have doubts or fears or thoughts of what if the emperor penguins leave the nest to provide for themselves and their families, um, to survive, they know they have to have to, the courage to step out and embrace these struggles. And if you've ever watched um, Planet Earth or any documentary about emperor penguins, you notice that they trip over themselves a lot. And they just get right back up, constantly tripping on to that freezing cold ice. And then they just get right back up, keep going. They um, demonstrate consistency in their long march. So when the temperatures take a, sh um, a sharp dip or the winds suddenly pick up or take an unexpected turn, they never stop walking. They never stop their route. And the last huge component of their resiliency I wanna share with you is their ability to be there for one another. So when the female emperor penguin lays her eggs, she takes off on a feeding sabbatical while the father balances the egg on his feet to warm it until the chick hatches. So foregoing food until the mother returns, he will stay on that egg. Aren't they so darling? So what are some examples that pop into your mind when it comes to nature being resilient? I wanna hear from you.
and feel free to unmute if you would like. There's not too many of us on here today. Oh, they're coming in. The weeds in my yard keep breaking through the weed barrier. <laughs> yeah, that, absolutely. Weeds are the most resilient. Land recovering from fire. Yes, we'll talk about that later too. Trees in the wind. I know, do you, was it last year or two years ago when we had that huge windstorm? I know some, some branches broke in Liberty Park, we had a lot, but there was also a lot that survived too. I think just being here, right? If you are still kicking, we are resilient in one way or the other. And so some ways that we can be resilient or learn from the examples around us is believing in your abilities and knowing that you can, you can do this and practicing positive affirmations. I'm not sure the internal dialogue of Emperor Penguin, but I'm sure there's some sort of um, purpose deep down or some sort of perseverance that just keeps them going. Oh, we have some more examples coming in. During forest fires, trees will drop seeds that are activated by fire, replenishing the forest. Absolutely, we have flowers that survive big rainstorms and bounce back and look beautiful. Cacti in the sun and harsh conditions, yes, yes. And we would know this, right, if we're getting outside regularly and we're getting these messages sent to us. And when we are outside paying attention, you could probably see in your own yard or even just going outside of your workplace some examples of adaptability and resilience that can provide you with hope um, for your life or just for the world around us. And I think a very important part of being resilient as a human is taking care of yourself and being proactive. So doing small things to better yourself, whether that's simply having a nutritious lunch, getting enough sleep, practicing some sort of stress management in order for us to be determined or to persevere, we need to focus on us first and then be proactive. And finding purpose in what you are doing, this can be really small or it can be really big. If your purpose, right, if you go home and your stress management is to knit, um, maybe the purpose is that stress management or if you're knitting something and maybe it's for someone to stay warm if you're knitting them a sweater, um, finding purpose in your job, whether that's, it can be the bigger picture, right? All, most of us are county employees, and so we're giving back to the community. You can think of it in that way, or you can keep it small. Like as a healthy lifestyles, um, as a healthy lifestyles coordinator, I like to think that these lunch breaks just give you a break from reality for an hour, right? Just giving you some sort of break and something else to focus on. So it can be something even, um, even simpler than that. Okay, so we've learned to be adaptable and then with adaptions, we've learned to be resilient to any of the harsh conditions that come our way. The next lesson that nature has to show us is patience. So nature never hurries and yet everything is accomplished sooner or later. So when you spend time in nature or if you spend time by the ocean or in the forest or in the desert, You'll notice nothing really happens in a rush. Nature grows without impatience at the growth process. But on the other hand, it seems that us human beings were constantly in a hurry. We overload ourselves with work that we can't fit into a 24 hour day, and then we get stressed out. But we can learn from the world around us to stop for a moment breathe, disconnect in order to reconnect with yourself, and set your priorities and change your life's tempo. And that's probably one of my favorite things about getting out into some sort of green space is things tend to slow down, right? I'm not sure if it's just because I'm slowing down as the hill gets steeper, or if I'm just starting to take things in a little bit more. 
And so we have this choice to either flow with the current or paddle against the stream. But when we're paddling against the stream, we're using a lot of energy and a lot of creativity and a lot of time when we work against the flow. So one of the greatest symbols that nature can show us is patience. And so I have a picture right here of a caterpillar making its cocoon to turn into a butterfly. And then I also have this bear right here waiting patiently for some salmon to pass by. What are some examples of patience in nature that you can think of? Spring bulbs, yes, especially if we're planting them in the fall or winter. Bees making honey. Growing a garden, yes. Sometimes it feels like with gardens that it takes forever to get started and then all of a sudden you have all of these things that you don't necessarily know what to do with. Trees growing, yes. These are fun examples. Hibernation. Yes, exactly. This bear's probably loading up on some last minute salmon, maybe finding some berries and then heading up to the cave to hibernate and be patient until it's springtime. We have elephants traveling. Even just seeing these examples in the chat box are making my breathing slow down a little bit. Just the patience, just enjoying, right? So imagine if we actually get ourselves out and about to actually see these things, how it can impact our life. The next um, lesson that nature has for us and to cultivate hope is that Nature is always growing and the growth is a process spread out over time. So in our modern day, we're constantly looking for some sort of quick fix or instant gratification. Uh, many of us get frustrated on how long it takes to master a new skill or to get a new mindset or to shed old habits that are no longer serving us but we really aren't meant to have all the answers at all at one time or arrive at a fully developed selves right off the bat. It takes that time and patience to grow. So one of my favorite examples of growth, I don't necessarily know if it's growth or it's kind of just a wonderful accident is the Grand Canyon. It was formed five to six million years ago when the Colorado River began to cut a channel through the layers of rocks. And so here is an aerial view of the Grand Canyon. Spectacular, right? So it's not necessarily growing, you know, from a seed to a blossom or anything like that, but growing into what it's become, whether it was on purpose or not. I think it also shows patience as well. Can you imagine the millions of years that a little stream or water or whatever, the wind, you know, all of those little tiny things like a, a small windstorm, you don't think that it's doing much, but in the grand scheme of things, it's created this plus the help of water. I think that that's crazy to think about. Could you imagine if we had a time lapse? I'm sure they've made, um, you know, reenactments of it, or I'm sure they can make it on a computer, but to actually have a time lapse of the Grand Canyon it would just be incredible. Sorry, I'm just sitting back and enjoying looking at this. <laughs> so, I have something too, if okay. you don't mind. Um, yeah, please I think, share. I think this, this also symbolizes the the small efforts that we make each and every day, no matter how small they may be, 
definitely help us in the, again, in the grand scheme of things, right? That bigger picture, bigger perspective, even though you may not see change um, immediately or even in the near future, right? You ultimately, if you stick with it, if it's something that benefits you and, and your health and wellness in your wellness journey, I think that it has the opportunity to make this grand, grand change in your life, you know? Yes, absolutely. This comes right back to um, physical or even mental health. Yeah, just doing small things can have a dramatic change later. It may not seem like it because like I mentioned before, if we are used to those quick fixes or we're used to huge transformations, we just kind of, that's, you know, we've been spoiled with technology. And so um, getting out of that mindset and knowing that good things take time. Patty said, think how long a cactus or a bonsai plant grows, small, but are over 100 years old or more. Yes. Yeah, just let that sink in. We shared in our weekly lineup a couple weeks ago of a deer's antlers falling off once a year and that they'll grow back during the spring. And I think that's a great example of growth and hope because the deer's antlers can remind us that that failing is a natural part um, process in life, but to always get back up, to learn from our mistakes and to become stronger. And so some lessons we can take away from the patience and growth is giving gratitude to these as well and giving gratitude to the process that you're still here, that you are still alive and you're able to um, find ways to improve and then giving yourself grace. I love how Brittany's been bringing up the bigger picture. So giving yourself grace when one thing has maybe gone off course, but knowing that you're making your way back up to the top. And also with growth comes rest and rest physically, of course, getting enough sleep, but giving yourself rest emotionally too. So yes, this is the Grand Canyon and um, it's extremely, extremely large and there's so many moving parts to make it what it is, but without some sort of rest, whether that's um, the springtime or fall time in this area or whatever it is for you emotionally giving yourself rest from the things that, um, from the things that are hard. Okay, my next lesson from nature is that everything has purpose and everything's connected to one another. So in a lake, the sun hits the water and helps the algae grow. The algae then produces oxygen for animals like fish. Small fish eat microscopic animals and absorb the oxygen with their gills and expel carbon dioxide which plants then use to grow. So if the algae disappeared, everything else would be impacted. If the microscopic animals wouldn't have enough food, then fish wouldn't have enough oxygen and plants would lose some of their carbon dioxide that they need to grow. So even something as small as the algae that's tucked below has a huge role and for these other beautiful trees to survive. Um, so humans spend their entire lives trying to find their purpose in life. And when we think that it's, it must be something extremely deep or something that maybe even be difficult to comprehend, we focus so deeply on that, that maybe we are focusing on the wrong things. And maybe it's something as simple as, as gazing or just laying in the grass, grazing up at the stars or just sitting by the lake on a hot summer day or finding some sort of meaning and purpose in the things around us or the people around us. I think this one shows a great example. And sometimes our purpose, it hides in smaller things like connection to, to nature 
or to those around you or maybe creating new ideas or helping others find their happiness or just enjoying life. I think we spend a lot of time kind of obsessing over that purpose when it could be something as as simple as surviving and thriving. So a couple of you mentioned before that forest fires have have a huge impact on our environment and sometimes actually may not be as destructive as we think. So I want to talk about that a little bit because with purpose and connection, even things that seem like an obstacle could actually serve a huge purpose in our lives or in the lives of the nature around us. So um, with destructive fires, um, if the fire is low in intensity and it does not grow out of control, it can actually benefit a lot of our wild lands and it's vital to the survival of several species. So this is nature's way of clearing out the dead litter on the forest floors. This allows important nutrients to return to the soil. It enables new healthy beginnings for plants and animals. They can also play an important role in the reproduction of some plants. So just like in life, if we have fires that seem destructive, if they are low in intensity and don't grow out of control, we can take a step back and see if they're serving some sort of purpose in our growth. And then hopefully with time, we find greater perspective that sometimes it's necessary to have darkness to appreciate the light, or we need to experience the opposite of what we want so we can appreciate and experience the things that we desire. Any thoughts? I want to hear from you. Sometimes I feel like I'm just here by myself talking to the computer. All right, I'll dive into more about connection. So as each thing has a purpose, uh, we're all connected to one another as well. So connection is all around us, not only just with human beings, but with the environment that we live in. And it sends an important message to us that we need one another to survive and we also need nature to survive. Oh, thank you. I'm memorized by the videos. <laughs> Oh, and Patty said, I think we need those things sometimes just to change direction. Yeah. I mean, hindsight's twenty twenty all the time, right? Sometimes when we're going through our own personal fires or we're going through a rough patch of a river or, or lake, sometimes when we get out to the other end, we think, oh, well, thank goodness I learned this or thank goodness we went this way or I would have ended up over here. So just keeping that perspective and that comes along with practicing gratitude on a regular basis. And one of my favorite examples of connection is actually the sun because it is millions of kilometers away from the earth. And it's a huge powerful force that impacts every single human on this earth, every single living species on this earth, yet it is so far away. And there wouldn't be any life or any nature on this earth without it. So I find that absolutely fascinating. Um, we had it mentioned before, a community of bees or ants, they all participate together to benefit all of those in their community. So each of them have their own calling, each of them have um, an ability to perform, and each part is necessary to have a functioning community or world. So embracing your response, your special responsibility, being proud of what you're contributing to the world and always doing your best because each of us is extraordinarily connected. And I think we learned that with COVID in a good way and in um, a bad way. Let's see, I do find that almost every bad thing eventually shows something good. It may take long time, but I do always end up finding it. I think that's a beautiful message to live by right so if you haven't found that message yet you just gotta 
got to keep on going until you find it. All right, so I have some examples of just some nature phenomenons that have happened in our world, whether it's it happened naturally or if it's a spiritual meaning, I thought it'd be fun to share those with you. Oh, for connection, I also had this video of um, fish at a coral reef as well. you want to check that out for a moment. Okay, so right here is a hidden beach in Mexico. I don't know if you've heard of it or not, but it was actually created by a bomb blast in Mexico. So it's just located only a few miles off of Mexico's coast and the hidden beach was caused by that bomb that was that actually was put on by the Mexican government as part of target practice. Um, something that may have seemed, you know, like a could have been a tragedy ended up being something that is extremely unique and something that is a huge destination for travelers and that people get to enjoy. So we have the view from up top of what it looks like and then what it's like when you're in here. And so to get there, you have to ride an hour long boat ride. But once you land on the island, you have to swim or um, you can paddle through the waters to reach this secluded area. But it says the beach is practically invisible, invisible to people. The next one is actually here in Utah. So the Pando Aspen Grove. So the Pando Aspen Grove is near Fish Lake and it is the largest Aspen clone and the most massive single living organism on earth. So it is over 47,000 aspens that had all originated from a single male parent aspen. So it shared its identical genetic makeup and that single male aspen genetically cloned itself and it has been doing so for thousands of years. So in total, it's about 106 acres of aspens. And it's not necessarily clear why and how this specific grove of aspens grew to be so large. There are some theories out there that the grove could have, um, it could have outcompeted other trees in the area with the ability to rapidly reproduce and grow. That is so cool. Yeah, and it's it's like an hour and a half away from here. Crazy though, right? But aspens, they have the ability to reproduce asexually, and so that's exactly what happened. So um, thousands of years ago, one tree just started cloning itself over and over and over again, and that's what's created this. And it's best to see in the fall. So this is a perfect time of year to go see. All right. And the last one I want to share with you is the double rainbow that was over Buckingham Palace last week. So a double rainbow appeared over the palace in London just minutes after Queen Elizabeth, um, Queen Elizabeth II's death was announced. So I don't necessarily, I mean, there is a great explanation for that secluded beach, right? There was a bomb um, and with the Pando Aspens, it, they're scientifically, right? They're cloning themselves, but it's when things like this happen, it kind of makes you think how that could have possibly happened so perfectly. And I think there's many, many things like that happen with nature that might have a spiritual or um, some sort of emotional feeling behind it or reasoning, but we may not necessarily know, but it's kind of fun to see those symbols.
All right. Well, I hope you had fun today discussing the hope that nature provides us each day. So if you have faith in tomorrow, we plant the seeds of hope today. You, you nourish them with love and attention and with hope that our labor will result in the fruits of the future. We can't impatiently force a garden to grow on our terms. A seed will sprout into a plant when the time is right. A fruit will fall from the tree when it is ripe and ready. They grow not because they're forced to, because they let go and allow divine energy and timing to run its course. So be persistent, patient, and have trust in timing. I think we easily take this beautiful world and its messages and lessons for granted. So don't wait for extraordinary moments to take your breath away. So go out into nature every single day and bring that beauty to all of you every single day because it's out there. It's just waiting for you to soak it all up. Does anybody have questions or anything that you want to share? <laughs>